Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm State Senator Anthony Portentino, and I'm honored to be here today with uh, Governor Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, and a terrific group of supporters, activists, and co-authors of one of the most important bills um, that I believe this legislative session is grappling with. Before I talk about the, the bill, I also want to, you know, just give uh, significant uh, props to our governor and our attorney general. You know, who leads a state matters, and today you're going to see why. Um, and who enforces the laws of a state matters, and today you're going to hear why. And we're blessed in California to have tremendous leadership, and clearly my colleagues behind me, the co-authors of this bill, also understand the importance of gun safety and what our country has been going through. Just in January alone, more um, gun violence has happened in America than the days in the month, and so I'm pleased to stand here. Um, it was important to me when we introduced SB 918 last June when the Supreme Court in the Bruin decision ruled New York concealed carry license law, which requires a concealed applicant to show proper cause, was unconstitutional. California had to act, and so we acted last year and we're acting again this year. It's more important today as we amend this critical bill to include improvements to California's existing concealed carry weapons regime in response to that Bruin decision. And this bill, which will be California law, will be even more important to the future. As we look back and remember that we came together at this critical hour to ensure that our laws remain a blueprint for the rest of the nation. And that's important because people are watching what California is doing and that's why we're leading. Uh, I was recently asked, why is it so important for California to lead on sensible firearm reforms and why was I so passionate about doing it? Well, the answer is very simple. There are far too many gun violence tragedies America, in America leading us to the point of almost becoming numb to them. And that is a tragedy of hope and optimism and just in and of itself that we might become numb to this tragedy. I also know what it's like to get a phone call telling me that my daughter and a friend are in lockdown at the local mall because there was an active shooter at that mall. And I had parents frantically calling me to see what was going on that no parent should face that. We have a fundamental responsibility to send our kids out into the world and know they're safe. They should go to school and know they're going to come home safely. Parents shouldn't have to wonder if something's going to happen. So today I want to acknowledge all of the co-authors of SB2 who are here today and some who had um, prior commitments and I know one is, is sick. So we have Senator Blakespear who campaigned on gun, sensible gun laws, and she's here with us, so I want to give her a shout out. Senator Bradford is also a co-author of this. Senator Min is a co-author. We have Assemblymember Gibson, Assemblymember Wicks, Assemblymember Carrillo, Assemblymember Gabriel, Assemblymember Bonta, um, not to be confused with the other Bonta, um, Assemblymember Bauer Cahan, Assemblymember Petrie Norris, and Assemblymember McCarty are all co-authors of this bill. Uh, today you're going to hear from a number of speakers. Um, following me will be Senator Bradford, uh, Assemblymember Carrillo will give remarks in Spanish, Chris Brown, the President of Brady will speak, Mike, uh, uh, Mike McGivley I think is the Policy Director of Gifford Center is going to speak. Uh, we have Mary Duplatt, volunteer with Moms Demand, and we have the Attorney General and again our great Governor is going to bat clean up for us today. So what does SPD, SB to do. It strengthens our state, and here's why. It ensures those carrying firearms in public are responsible, law-abiding citizens. That's important. We're not taking someone's Second Amendment away. We're ensuring that the Second Amendment is properly applicable to people who weren't getting a concealed carry permit. It protects children and young adults from gun violence by setting them a minimum age requirement to 21. You have to be 25 to rent a car. Think about that. You have to be 25 to rent a car. Mm -hmm. It's reasonable to say you have to be 21 to get a concealed carry permit. Advancing safety through stronger training requirements. Again, you have to be trained to fly a plane. You have to be trained to drive a car. You should have strong training requirements if we're going to give you the responsibility to have a concealed weapon. We safeguard the public by identifying certain sensitive public places. You don't need a gun to go to Dodger Stadium or to your daughter's AYSO soccer game or into a government building or into a bar where they serve alcohol. And so we're going to use the Supreme Court decision to have a robust list of prohibited 
places. Let's be frank, gun violence inflicts a terrible toll on our communities. Last year, nearly 20,000 people were killed in gun-related homicides in the United States. To put that in perspective, it's enough people to fill 40 wide-body Boeing 777 planes, and the numbers keep rising. So we know the need is great. We know that California must act. And under the leadership of Governor Newsom and Attorney, bon Attorney General Bonta and this great group of legislators, we're going to make a difference. We're going to pass SB2 both through both houses, put it on the governor's desk, get a signature, and make California, Californians and our children safer when they go out on Main Street. So with that, thank you all for being here. And I want to bring up Senator Bradford, who will be our next speaker. Thank you all for being here. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you, Senator Portentino, for your bold and courageous leadership on this very important but common sense measure. Uh, I'm Senator Steve Bradford from the 35th Senate District, and I serve as Vice Chair of the Legislative Black Caucus. And uh, this is a priority for the Legislative Black Caucus, sensible gun legislation. I'm honored to be a principal co-author of SB2. Uh, this legislation promotes reasonable and responsible ownership and reduces the potential of gun violence here in California. SB2 is what our state needs now to make sure people who are authorized to carry concealed weapons in California are law abiding and responsible. SB2 is a stark contrast to what states like Florida we hear that want to allow anyone to carry concealed weapons without a permit at all. That's a reckless approach and endangers everyone and will literally lead to more deaths. America leads the world in gun deaths. But that is not who we are in California. The new procedures laid out in SB2 will make California laws consistent with the Supreme Court recent decision in Bruin case and keeps Californians safe. SB2 will make sure there are reasonable limits to where you can bring a gun. Having firearms in schools, Colleges, movie theaters, government buildings, restaurants, hospitals makes absolutely no sense. We owe it to each and every one of us, of the 40 million Californians, to take this action and pass SB2. I want to thank you all again for being here, and now I want to bring forth uh, my friend, my colleague, but fearless leader, none other than Assemblywoman Wendy Carrillo, to add her voice to this important issue. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. I will be providing some uh, Spanish commentary. Uh, buenos dias. Mi nombre es Wendy Carrillo. Yo soy la representante de la Asamblea del Estado uh, del Distrito 52, representando la ciudad de Los Ángeles y el este de California. También soy la comisionada de parte de la Asamblea a la Comisión de Salud Mental del Estado. El junio pasado, la Corte Suprema determinó en el caso de rifles y pistolas del Estado de Nueva York contra Bruin que la ley de las licencias de deportación ocultas que requiere un aplicante que demuestre una causa justificada para cargar una arma uh, será, era uh, contra la Constitución del Estado. Nuestra respuesta en la legislatura del Estado de California tiene que mantener las aseguranzas de seguridad que nosotros en este Estado hemos logrado para nuestras comunidades. En la ley SB2, escrita por el senador Portantino, mis colegas en, la, en el Senado y la Asamblea, y pro, uh, patrocinada por el gobernador Newsom y el fiscal general Rob Bonta, implementará varios cambios positivos a la Ley de Armas Ocultas del Estado de California. SB2 requiere que cualquier persona que solicite un permiso de porte oculto no sea una persona que fue descalificada según su evaluación de riesgo. Según SB2, cada solicitante será requerido a revelar todos sus arrestos anteriores, condenas penales, órdenes de restricción o de protección y tener referencias para ayudar en su evaluación. La ley forzará la seguridad de las armas en California contra las medidas siguientes, requiriendo entrenamiento adicional para solicitantes de armas, Ampliación de las zonas libres de arma, convierte la mínima de edad de 18 a 21 años, establece un proceso uh, con más orden para las licencias y para, para las licencias. La violencia armada 
aflige un costo terrible para nuestras comunidades. Hemos visto demasiados ejemplos del, hor del horror y el sufrimiento que esto causa en, nuestras, en nuestra nación y en nuestras comunidades, especialmente los, los hechos más, más recientes de Monterey Park, Half Moon Bay y otros más. El año pasado, casi 20,000 personas murieron en homicidios re relacionados con armas de fuego en los Estados Unidos. Desafortunadamente, este número solo crece cada día. Y el problema no es solucionada simplemente con pasar leyes contra las armas ilegales. Al menos el 76% de las armas utilizadas en tiroteos masivos se obtuvieron legalmente. Existe amplia evidencia que el aumento a la aportación pública de armas conduce más violencia. El Departamento de Justicia consultó con expertos y académicos de seguridad pública para garantizar que esta medida sea constitucional aquí en California y también que guíe a la Corte Suprema con la decisión de la Corte Suprema contra Bruen. Ahora, como siempre, tenemos una responsabilidad de ser líderes y tener soluciones, Rep uh, representantes de la gente de este estado para hacer todo nuestro poder para evitar nuestra, nuestra comunidades sean aterrorizadas por más tiroteos masivos. Continuamos la lucha hoy y siempre y anticipo con esperanza dirigir este esfuerzo con mis colegas en la legislatura, con el Procurador General Banta y con el goberna Gobernador Newsom. Esta, esta es una oportunidad de demostrar el ejemplo positivo que este estado hacia, hace hasta el resto de la nación. Muchas gracias. Uh, now I would like to introduce Chris Brown, a lifelong advocate and president of the Brady Campaign. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Chris Brown, president of Brady United Against Gun Violence, and it's a pleasure to be here today with so many incredible leaders in the uh, fight for safety, for the, the fight for people's lives. And California, like in so much else, is really leading the way, thanks to the leadership of Governor Newsom and Attorney General Bonta and the champions in the state legislature, like those behind me, and certainly Senator Portentino. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing to lead the way. And we saw this last year with the passage of forward-thinking and important bills passed by the legislature, signed by this governor, the strongest ghost gun law, and the industry accountability bill, which is so very important to this movement. And again here today, in the wake of several preventable tragedies, your leaders in this state are taking action. And it makes a difference. It makes a real difference. In fact, California has the seventh lowest firearm death rate in the country, and the firearm death rate in California is 36% lower than the national average. Of course, we are all reeling from the horrific tragedies that we've experienced here in the state, but stronger gun laws save lives every single day. And in fact, between 2016 and 2018, California's gun violence restraining order law prevented 58 mass shooting threats. There are people alive today in this state because of the actions taken, and this is no exception. SB2 takes massive steps in protecting California residents from the disastrous effects of last year's Bruin decision, which overturned New York's permitting system that had been in effect for a century. And now states like California are making sure and reacting to that because this goes against the, the idea of guns everywhere in this country. And what we're seeing is updating and improvement in California's already strong concealed carry licensing system through SB2 that will it, create a more comprehensive and thorough vetting system. The legislation also ensures that those are, who are carrying firearms in public have proper licensing, adequate training, and are not at risk of harming themselves or others. Also importantly, this legislation will ensure that guns will not be allowed in sensitive areas, including, just as examples, playgrounds, 
amusement parks, bars, preschools, child care facilities, all forms of public transportation, hospitals and care facilities, public event spaces, parks and athletic areas open to the public, and more. In recent years, we have seen the gun lobby push for more guns everywhere by creating imagined threats and stoking fears of a country where individuals will need to defend themselves with a firearm at any time. And I would put to you, that is a country where the Second Amendment completely swallows the first. That is not the land of the free. That is not the home of the brave. And this step is very important, not only for the public safety of Californians, but I can guarantee you Brady and many advocates in this room will make sure that many other states follow suit. So thank you so much. And I'd like to introduce Mike McLively, Policy Director of Giffords. Thanks so much, Chris. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike McLively. I'm the Policy Director of the Giffords Center for Violence Intervention. Giffords is a national nonprofit organization named after former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who was shot back in 2011 while hosting an event for her constituents in Tucson, Arizona. Gabby's always talking about how it takes courage to fight gun violence. And all too often in this country, our political leaders do nothing in the face of a gun violence epidemic that claims tens of thousands of lives every year. However, here in California, in the face of tragedy, our leaders act. They have come together time and time again to change our laws and transform community safety. They've led the nation in gun safety reform, saving lives and making California a state with one of the lowest gun death rates in the nation, 37% lower than the national average, as you've heard. And today that work continues, for although we have come a long way, we are still not immune to the tragedy of gun violence. As we know, communities across California are grieving at least 26 people murdered in mass shootings in just one single week. And so many of our communities, especially communities of color, know painfully well the daily toll of shootings that never make the national news, but that nonetheless leave a wake of trauma and loss and human sorrow. Here in California, we are fortunate to have leaders who are committed to ending all forms of the gun violence epidemic. After achieving an all-time record low in gun violence rates in 2019, California has, like every other part of this country, faced a record spike in gun sales and gun violence since the start of the COVID pandemic. Leaders like those gathered here today have responded with bold, serious, and effective measures to improve public safety and treat gun violence like the public health crisis that it is, including one of the nation's largest investments in addressing community violence through the California Violence Intervention and Prevention Program, also known as CalVIP. Unlike political leaders in many other states, in the face of tragedy, both mass shootings and the daily tragedy of everyday gun violence in our most vulnerable communities, California's leaders have found the courage to act. And for that, we are extremely grateful and proud. We also know that there's unfinished business and more work left to do. A critical priority for this year is the passage of Senate Bill 2, which would help our communities respond to the U.S. Supreme Court's radical Bruin ruling from last summer. That unfortunate ruling has already invited a flood of applicants seeking to carry more loaded firearms into public spaces in California. The research is clear that this will threaten, not improve public safety and will make it more likely for everyday arguments and misunderstandings to escalate into shootings and more funerals. This bill will require standardized, stronger standardized vetting and safety training to ensure people with significant histories of violence or irresponsible behavior are not qualified to carry guns in public spaces. Importantly, it would establish statewide uniform standards to protect sensitive public locations like public parks, playgrounds, sports arenas, and bars as off limits to carrying weapons. We are fortunate and proud to have committed partners in this movement and state leaders who invested in this effort and committed to the ongoing work of strengthening our gun safety laws and protecting our communities. These leaders have the courage to act we are proud to endorse Senate Bill 2 and look forward to working with our partners to pass this bill, this bill into law and to ensuring continued progress on gun safety reform in this state, including 
protecting and expanding investments in effective gun violence prevention and intervention strategies. Thank you so much, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mary Duplois, who is a survivor of gun violence and a volunteer with Bombs Demand Action. She's the survivor lead and the Students Demand Action chapter lead here in Sacramento. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I had to warn him I'm a shorty. Okay. Um, my name is Mary Duplaw, and I'm a volunteer with Moms Demand Action. My heart aches for the families impacted by the recent mass shootings in our state and the fear and sadness that follows in the wake of such senseless gun violence. I am also painfully aware of the hurt felt by so many families torn apart by gun violence, whose stories do not make the news. My daughter, Lorna Clark, died in 1988 at age 19 after she was shot and killed by her boyfriend in Chico, California. Hmm. Lorna was a beautiful, talented young woman, an artist and an actress. In the year before her death, she was accepted into the first California Summer School for the Arts, a prestigious summer school. There she was recruited by several colleges. She chose Chico State. It was such an exciting time for her, for all of her family. She moved to Chico, but she never got to attend a single class. She never got to have a family. She never got to reach for her dreams. Her life was senselessly cut short by a gun. The last time I saw Lorna in person was when she was testifying before a legislative committee on behalf of the California State Summer School for the Arts at the state capitol, and her art was on display there. On that day, I got my last hug from my daughter. It's still painful all these years later. Lorna and our young people are the reason I stand here today. Enough is enough. California leads the nation in the fight against gun violence, yet there is still work to do. It's up to us to stand up to the gun industry that floods our communities with guns and puts their profits before our safety. We must pass Senate Bill 2. We need to do everything we can to ensure that hidden weapons are kept out of sensitive places where guns don't belong. And we need to make sure we don't let people who are under restraining orders or who have had a recent history of violent behavior carry guns in public. I am grateful to stand with these champions like our Governor Newsom, our state lawmakers, and our other allies in this fight. I know that California can lead the way, and I thank you for being here. Now I'd like to introduce California's Attorney General, Rob Monta. Good morning, Rob Bonta, California Attorney General, and let me first say how honored and grateful and proud I am to stand with this incredible group of California leaders from across the state who have come together to continue to push, to continue to fight, uh, to continue to make progress to help keep Californians across this state safe. Uh, I'm proud to stand with you. I'm honored to fight with you. I thank you for being here today and every day, including when the cameras aren't on and no one's looking to fight for the safety of Californians and take common sense steps that we know will, will save lives. I also want to say that we gather today in a, a time of pain, um, anguish, sadness, and we're committed to turning that pain into action and turning that sadness into change. And so, um, again, grateful for the, the team that we have here. Special shout out to Senator Portentino uh, for his resilience, his commitment, his tenacity uh, to continue to fight for a bill uh, which we know is important to keep Californians safe. If you have not been moved by the need to end gun violence in recent days, not, uh, if you're not scratching your head asking why, 
if you're not uh, searching your memory banks and uh, determining what are our next steps, then you have not been paying attention. We have in America a internationally unique tragedy and, and epidemic when it comes to gun violence. Only here do we have gun violence at this level. It's only here that do gun violence tragedies happen as frequently uh, as they do. And we know that we cannot accept the unacceptable. And here, this group, California, is saying we won't. As we wait for other states and the federal government to do their part, to act. And let me be clear, they must act. They need to step up. And it's easy. Do what California is doing. Simple. We have the blueprint. Copy it. You don't need to recreate anything. We've done it. But while we wait for them to do more, to keep Californians and Americans safe, we're going to act. We're going to do more. We're going to fight. We know that uh, enough is enough. <coughs> enough families, children, loved ones, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, uh, we have lost uh, to senseless gun violence. And we know that we have seen this tragedy in too many everyday places dance halls and places of work and gas stations and nightclubs and um, places where people should be safe and should feel safe. And so uh, with this legislation I'm proud, that I'm proud to sponsor, we will strengthen the concealed carry weapon laws in the state of California in the wake of the Bruin decision. Let me be absolutely clear, this is Bruin compliant. It is designed to comply with the Supreme Court's dictates and direction uh, when it comes uh, to concealed carry weapon regimes. Uh, the Supreme Court has made clear there are two pathways uh, where we can make progress to keep uh, Californians safe and people safe, that we are not in a regulatory straitjacket, the very words from uh, the Supreme Court case, that we can identify sensitive places where concealed carry weapons should not be carried, and that we can also have fair, objective safety evaluations before we provide a concealed carry weapon um, permit to an individual. And so we are saying if you recklessly break the law, if you are an irresponsible individual, you should not be allowed to carry a concealed firearm in public. You should not have a license to put our loved ones at risk, period, full stop, end of story. And that's what this bill does. And this bill, this approach, it's about the facts. Here are some facts. Guns in more places make our communities more dangerous. Fact. One recent study found that right to carry laws where there are unrestrictive or less restrictive permitting regimes increase violent crime involving a firearm by 29 percent. Here's another fact. You are more likely to become a victim of crime, including a victim of gun violence, in states like Texas, Tennessee, and Alabama, where you can carry a gun in public, essentially unfettered. Another fact, California has among the strongest gun safety laws in the nation, and we have one of the lowest firearm mortality rates in the nation. That is not dumb luck. That is not accident. That is not happenstance. It's not even correlation. It is causation. We have lower firearm mortality rates because of our stronger gun safety laws, period. It's a fact. It's not debatable. And today with this legislation, we're going further. We're leaning in. We're going to save more lives. In the face of our gun violence crisis, we have a choice. Do we do what many states across this country have done, which is put your head in the sand, ignore? and do nothing? Or do we step up? Do we act? Do we push? Do we do? In California, uh, we're built different. We are different. We do. We act. We push. We will not accept the unacceptable, and we will do everything in our power that's constitutionally compliant to protect the safety, health, and welfare of our children, of our families, of our communities throughout the state. That's what we're doing here today, and I'm proud to be part of this incredible team.
And with that, let me uh, introduce our, our great governor who has shown time and time again his courage, his strength, his commitment. He has called out the hypocrisy in other states, and he has promoted unapologetically the values of our state, the great governor, Gavin Newsom. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I was saying, I'm, quite literally, I have nothing to add. Uh, not figuratively, actually, literally, uh, nothing to add except uh, gratitude, uh, appreciation for all of those remarkable leaders, Senator Portentino, uh, in particular, Attorney General Rob Bonta, who drove this effort last year. Uh, and we'll be driving it as we initiate the new legislative uh, session this year to all of those uh, that hold perhaps an even more extraordinary title, and that is uh, leaders with moral authority, those with moms that demand action, and Brady and Giffords. None of this is possible without you. None of California's progress in gun safety uh, has been possible uh, without your extraordinary leadership and your capacity to distill the essence of what uh, this is all about. And uh, I will assure you, having spent uh, the latter part of the last, uh, well, 10 or so days visiting with victims of violence, two mass shootings, one in Half Moon Bay and, of course, uh, Monterey Park. Uh, this is brought uh, into uh, form and substance that only furthers my resolve to continue uh, California's rightful position as a leader in the gun safety movement. It has been said, uh, but let me punctuate uh, the point that was asserted and reinforce it. Uh, the national conversation in gun safety has been led by the state of California. Going back to, you can argue, the year of my birth, 1967, May, uh, where we began the process of advancing common sense gun safety reforms. 1989, the assault weapons ban leadership that emanated out of the state of California in 1994 with the national assault weapons ban by our own Senator Dianne Feinstein after the tragedies of the 101 California shooting. We continued to recognize with humility that we can do more and better and was punctuated as well that uh, we did just that last year with the ghost guns legislation and extending uh, liability to uh, manufacturers of these weapons, particularly weapons of mass destruction. We uh, continued that leadership uh, with remarkable leaders behind me, uh, led an effort around marketing to children and just the, just the outrage as a parent of seeing blue pacifiers and pink pacifiers used in ads to promote JR-15s so that young children, babies, can learn the muscle memory that is required when they're old enough or perhaps unfortunate enough to be in the possession of a weapon of mass destruction, uh, an AR-15 type platform. Uh, it's remarkable we're living at this moment in time. It's also remarkable, it's a point of contrast, that we're living a moment in time where you have states like Florida moving in the exact opposite direction. It was stated earlier this week, the governor of Florida wants to move without any permits or any consideration, no requirements whatsoever, none for training. Why should you be trained? Despite all the evidence, not even evidence, it's not even, there's no controversy here. That everything that was stated was factual. I think the only distinction is at 36 or 37% lower than the national average, the gun death rate in the state of California. Is it 58 percent or 59 percent lower gun death rate for children? Are we the seventh lowest or the 44th highest in terms of safety related to gun safety? Those are the only distinctions in the data. Gun safety saves lives. More guns, more lives lost. The data is overwhelming. You saw in the dissent of this New York decision that reinforced by the justices that pointed out uh, more handguns, more suicides. More handguns, more suicides. Three times more likely men to die of suicides in the possession of handgun. Seven times, if you're a woman, more likely to die of suicide with handguns. This will lead to more handgun possession, more suicides. This will lead to more officer-involved shootings, no officers being killed in the line of duty. Three times higher rate of incidents on the basis of the number of guns in their states. These are the facts. They're not only in evidence, they're well understood by those that are open argument interested in evidence. It's not understood by the ideologues, and that's what we're up against. The history-only ideologues that go back to, well, their selected history of what the world looked like in 1790, when there were, what, 300? Four million people living in America. 
biggest city in America, New York, I think had maybe 32, 33,000 people, predominantly rural farmers. This history-only approach, you're seeing it over and over again. I look forward to Judge Benitez's decision. It's already written where he's likely to overturn our assault weapons ban. Stay tuned. That's a preview of things to come in the next few weeks. Large capacity magazine clips. That will likely be thrown out by these same ideologues. We saw Judge Nelson, great Trump appointee, who talked about revolutionary armies, and how young men were the ones that stood between freedom and tyranny, presumably um, somehow equating those that are doing the same with you know, AR-15s or other assault weapons to those with muskets. I mean, it's perverse. The whole thing is perverse. And the selectivity of the history on the approach is well understood by those that, well, are willing to understand history. Read the dissent on this decision for a master class in understanding the absurdity of the decision that forces us to the position we're in today, where we have to remove the word may and insert the word shall. Shall provide this right, as they assert, but with conditions and caveats that I think are quite thoughtful and learned based upon reality, lived reality, based upon public safety and the need and desire to keep you safe, keep our law enforcement officers safe, to keep people that are struggling safe. And so that's what brings us all here, is that spirit. Um, and I couldn't be more proud of the remarkable leaders that are assembled here today once again. There is an elephant in the room. We fell short last year. No one's naive about that. There was one disappointing thing about a remarkable legislative year. Uh, it was that we fell a little short. That's not going to happen this year. No question about that. Um, and, uh, and that's because you've been given up and you're not going to give in to that cynicism. So we're here with absolute confidence and expectation. You can write that one. Write that check. Take that, what's the old phrase, to the bank. I will be signing this legislation. I don't think that. I know that. So you can ask me how. I just do. It's just going to happen um, because of the folks behind me and because it's the right thing to do. Um, and so we're at that moment um, where uh, we need to also be mindful in this final words, and we'll open up to many questions I imagine you have on this subject. Um, but mindful, as was stated, that despite the efficacy of our gun safety laws that have been nation leading, no other state doing more, not just to lead the national conversation, but to advance common sense gun safety, that the last few weeks just remind us that this is, you know, we're not an island on our own, that we need the federal government to participate and advance similar, as Rob was saying, common sense. But it's hard. I, I was there at Monterey Park thinking, is this a two- or three-day national story? And the next day I was in Half Moon Bay saying, is this a one-day story? Well, why don't you check your national feeds? 50-plus mass shootings was stated so far this year. 50. There's, I don't know how many days in January, 30, 31. 50 so far. 50-plus. 50 1,500 people just gunned down, and it's just become so normalized. We're just not going to allow that. We're going to continue to do more and do better with humility. We're going to continue to assess what did or did not occur as it relates to those mass shootings that have been well chronicled, understand what we can do to complement the work, because it's solving for a pattern. We're trying to solve for a pattern. And we're not going to lay, we're going to fall prey to the predictable response to every shooting. Well, this law in this case wouldn't have solved this issue. There's a pattern. And California's been solving for a pattern, and it's working. We're saving lives, but we have more work to do. And this is part of this effort, and I couldn't be, again, more proud to be with all of you at this time, and I cannot 
uh, impress upon you more how much I look forward to signing this bill as soon as it gets to my desk. With that, we're here to answer any questions you Governor, guys may have. The list of places that um, concealed weapons would be banned very long in yeah. the bill. There, there is a notable exception that says that if business owners or churches put up a sign that says guns are okay, then that that's allowed. So I'm wondering why that was included and do you support that? Well, let's talk to our author who's more eager than anyone to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you've heard a number of us today. First of all, I want to say thank you to the governor and thank you to the attorney general for sponsoring this legislation because that's going to get through in a robust form because of their expertise and their passion. So I just want to make sure we're clear about that. You've heard many of us use the word reasonable, common sense, prudent. We want this to be constitutional at the end of the day. Uh, this is not window dressing. This is to put a strong bill on the governor's desk that's going to withstand the legal challenge that's sure to come. And by having that provision, you can't argue that it's a total prohibition. You can't argue that it's somehow so prescriptive that people can't have some sovereignty over the issue. And I think that's a, a legal nuance that I think helps it with constitutional muster. And I don't know if the AG wants to comment on that from his perspective as well. But that's yeah. Well, let me just say that the, the sensitive site component of the bill is super important. Again, um, uh, following the blueprint of, of Bruin, uh, there are quite a, a number of reasons or whys behind the, the sensitive sites, including protecting children in places like parks and schools and, and uh, playgrounds, making sure that we don't have guns in places where, um, where alcohol is served, and also making sure that there aren't guns to intimidate uh, others from exercising their, their rights, like the right to vote in polling stations or um, uh, the, the right to free assembly or uh, the legislative process in government buildings. So a lot of important reasons behind the sensitive sites. I don't want you to just see it as a list. There's a why behind every one it's been thought of. Um, and when it comes to some of the um, private um, property locations, of course we have private uh, property uh, ownership rights. Uh, the default is uh, concealed carry weapons are not allowed. If you affirmatively state that you, on your own property, uh, want to allow them, then the bill allows for that. Um, you also know that there's a um, component in the New York law that's very similar, that's being um, appealed right now. We have an amicus uh, brief that we filed from the California Department of Justice that, uh, in support of that position, uh, we think that strikes the right balance between uh, property ownership rights and gun safety uh, in a broader regime that will keep people safe. address this question of constitutionality and sort of try to head off legal challenges from last year's bill? The, the changes in the bill um, are not significantly substantive from last year. I mean, the, the AG's office did a, a very, in my opinion, a good job of sort of using the Bruin decision and the, the opinions of the justices to craft what we have. So there's an exemption for uh, sheriff's uh, department employees that's a prudent exemption. That's different from last year. There's a, a, a change in uh, if you're at a school site, making sure that you have to lock your weapon in your car. You can't take that lockbox into the school site. That's another one of the changes from last year. So they're not, the, and then raising the purchase age, making clear it's consistent with other California law that you have to be 21 to purchase a gun. Those are the three big changes from last year. But the, the roadmap that Bruin provided is what the Attorney General's office and alleged counsel have used to craft what we're at today. Can I ask about the 21 age? Because last year, a federal appeals court overturned one of the laws that California has already passed, trying to raise the age for selling semi automatic weapons to 21. So that seems to you know, raise questions about whether the 21 age also puts this I can't say we're not looking at that case because we are, but we do feel that th the way it's crafted in SB2, it will withstand constitutional muster. And again, m we do have the, the general gun purchase age in California to 21, and that still is the law of California. So it's consistent with California law, and we think it's going to withstand constitutional muster. Senator, why no urgency clause on this bill? There was one on SB918 last year. What's, what's changed? So two reasons. We can always put it in as it goes through the process. So that door is not closed. The second piece is we want to make sure that we do the right thing in how we craft it. And again, as other states and other courts make decisions, we're going to be monitoring that as it goes through the legislative process. And so we want the nimble 
uh, the ability to be nimble, to make sure that whatever we send to Governor Newsom is the strongest bill possible, but also the most constitutionally sound bill. So we're not going to rush that. We owe it to the, Cali to the people of California to be as prudent and judicious through the process. If we get to the point where we're pleased with the final product and there's still time to make it an urgency, that's a conversation that the governor, uh, the attorney general, and I will have to see if we want to put it in. But we have time to do that. But let's start by just focusing on the policy and getting it through the through the process. Attorney General Bonta, you were on the floor of the assembly when this bill kept striking out late at night. And I'm wondering what the conversations were among members. What were the concerns with this piece <coughs> of legislation for those who were not willing to get it through? Let me answer that question in one second. I want to answer, uh, add to Ms. Lagos' er er earlier um, question about the constitutional compliance of the bill. We, we believe last year's bill was constitutionally compliant. We believe this bill is constitutionally compliant. We followed the guidance of Bruin. Uh, we immediately said there will be no good cause or proper cause component. That part was struck down by the Bruin decision. We understand that. We immediately said that is no longer enforceable. That's severed from uh, the California law. And there was also um, guidance that we need to have more objective standards that are not gray and subjective. We try to be clear, certain, specific, objective with the standards that are set forth. Uh, one other change in addition to the uh, ones that Senator Portantino um, pointed out is uh, the prior version of the bill uh, had requirements to become qualified to get a CCW. This approach um, in, in SB2 assumes you're qualified unless you're disqualified. And so it's a, a little bit semantics, but it's, it's a real substantive change. Um, and, and that's in the bill as well. Uh, last year, at the end of session, uh, we had the votes until we didn't have the votes. Uh, that's how it is at the end of session. Having been at the end of session uh, nine times in my uh, legislative career, um, uh, there are folks who on another day and another time would have voted for the bill. Just not that day and that night. And so uh, they're going to have to live with the decisions that they made and the impact that it has on California. Um, but we're confident. Uh, uh, we're not looking backward, we're looking forward. We're confident <coughs> we'll get the votes this year, and we'll make the community safer throughout California. Governor, are you more confident that it will pass this year because of a lot of the new progressive members that joined the legislature? No, just, uh, uh, they, what the Attorney General just said is spot on. I mean, this, we have the votes. It's, I mean, we, and more than that was for the urgency clause, which is a much higher threshold. Just the majority will get this done. It's a 90-day distinction between whether or not we do an urgency or whether it lands. So I'd like to see it as soon as possible. But that's the art of what's possible. It's, these are the experts. They'll, they'll guide that with the leadership of the Assembly and the Senate. Um, and uh, I'm not fixated on that. The progress we made last year on gun safety, again, second to none. California led last year um, in this is an opportunity to take a look at the landscape. In some ways, this is, um, uh, gives us, as the Attorney General said, uh, the ability to, to make some tweaks uh, in real time and, as the author said, to continue uh, to be iterative based upon court rulings that we're seeing across the country and other efforts, similar efforts across the nation. So uh, I think we're in a very good place, and uh, I don't think the makeup of legislature dramatically changes things, though I am more optimistic uh, still uh, with the makeup because uh, a lot of the new members, uh, many I'll be seeing tonight at a reception, uh, have expressed uh, passionate desire to be participatory in more gun safety initiatives. Governor, the issue has um, been increasingly raised as a public health crisis, uh, the flood of guns on the streets. And I wonder, especially as someone who has done so much in the area of social determinants and, and, and root causes, what, if anything, you think the public health system and, and perhaps the health care system has to answer for this crisis, as we're seeing it unfolding. I don't know if they have to answer to much. I mean, some of the most forceful leaders uh, have been emergency room physicians and uh, in, in organizations representing them uh, because they see this carnage firsthand, as I did last week. I was in, in, in two different hospitals, met four victims, one in the ICU, um, uh, one whose leg was shattered and a rod was uh, placed. It uh, wasn't lost on me. The first thing he had to ask of me was uh, was a question that uh, he should have asked his doctor, and so when do I get out of here? And I said, well, let me bring the doctor in. He says, no, 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 no. When do I get out of here for a different reason? He says, because I don't have insurance, and I can't pay. And I said, you don't have to worry about that. Legislature appropriated money last year. 
dollars, 8.7 million specifically, we identified just in the victim services that was added last year for the DA's office in LA County alone. And that's in addition to everything else we're doing. Uh, but the idea that it, one has that mindset only reinforces uh, just the absurdity of this American made reality. This is American made. concealed weapon permits are given to people who are law-abiding. Um, I know experts have called for a tighter licensing scheme statewide, maybe more publicization uh, of Ting's gun violence restraining order. Are those things you're going to focus on? Is there anything beyond this you want to talk about? Well, we, we, we weren't, uh, we had rules and regulations prior to this New York decision that have their historical footings, as was suggested, in 1911. They've been tested. We had protocols in place along the lines of what, uh, how you framed that question. Um, they disrupted that, and they forced a different consciousness. Now it's not good moral character. Uh, now we don't have the capacity to uh, adjudicate certain uh, points uh, that we prior uh, had prior, and, and now we have a, a provision may to shell, and uh, that forces our hand on the other side uh, around sensitive places. I find it the height of irony, these same judges that are pontificating uh, around these historical uh, traditions are the same ones that have no problem limiting those same weapons from their courtrooms. <laughs> We've heard today that California often leads the nation when it comes to legislation like this. At the federal level, you have a new party in control of Congress, a new Speaker of the House who's District is a relatively short drive from here. Have you well, you, you heard from the speaker his, 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 his deep concern and passion expressed around the two shootings in his home state. I mean, you, 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 that was expressed immediately after the Monterey Park and, uh, and uh, Half Moon Bay. If I appear to be facetious, um, have you had any conversations with him about this? I have near expectation that he has the capacity of leadership in this space. He's never demonstrated it. He wants to roll back all these rules and regulations. Of course, he represents the murder capital of California. What can you do, as you say, to make the federal government participate in this space? We could continue through the power of emulation. Success leaves clues. We're not a small, isolated state. We're the fourth largest economy on planet Earth. We're the tenth pole of the American economy. There's no more essential state than the state of California. We've led in a bipartisan way going back to 1967. Success leaves clues. As the Attorney General himself said, wisely, appropriately, um, and emphatically, we have the playbook. But we need participants. You saw in the Gilroy shooting, the shooter was able to go to a neighboring state without the rules and regulations. So this is a national disgrace. It's a national epidemic. It's American-made. We've chosen this reality. We've chosen this reality. It's happened on our collective watch. And they're choosing this for their kids and their grandkids. They're choosing to put law enforcement in more harm's way. They're choosing to put victims, young, innocent people in harm's way. They choose that as they sell fear around crime. They sell calm around these perverse, perverse gun laws that they promote or provisions of the Constitution that they, with respect, I think, pervert. Mr. Senator, Governor, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Governor, for the folks down in the Central Valley, uh, the, the, the Selma police officer who was just shot and killed, uh, I know you released a statement on that today. Of course. I know the district attorney in Fresno County was uh, released a statement which did not appear to be very pleased for she blamed, uh, I believe, AB 109, and it's commonly called as a prison. Why does she leader. blame herself? I'm sorry? She should blame herself. I've been listening to this for years from her. She has the prosecutorial discretion. Ask her what she did in terms of prosecuting that case. I'm sick and tired of being lectured by her on public safety. Hmm. Sick and tired. So with all due respect to her statement, she should be ashamed of herself and she look in the mirror. And, and follow up uh, from 
the Tulare County Sheriff. I, I know that after the Goshen uh, mass shooting a few weeks ago, uh, he is asking you to uh, look into the death penalty for a, a gun violence assailants who target uh, babies or infants. Do you believe that uh, is a good or bad idea? I think we should find the perpetrators. I think we need to close that case. last year and Attorney General Bonta were in the back of the chamber. This is a question for you, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how involved in the process are you going to be this year to making sure it gets across the finish line? And then uh, the recent unfortunate mass shootings have been mentioned many times, but how much evidence is there that this is a CCW problem? Um, and can you respond to criticism uh, from Republicans and Second Amendment groups that California should instead be looking at the criminal I, I appreciate it. It's, it's what I was alluding to a moment ago. It's, it's just it's, it's just tried and true. It's routine. Every time there's a mass shooting, this won't particular this particular law, this particular reaction won't solve for that. But you can solve for a pattern. California's proven that over the course of decades. We have solved for a pattern more than most other states. Demonstrably true. Thirty seven percent reduction or rather lower gun death rate than other states, 67%, I think, in the 2020 data, than Texas. Last place I want to be is Texas. And these judges, Benitez and Nelson, who was on that 21 age, want to turn us into Texas. We're going to fight back against that and those instincts and those Republican talking points over and over and over again. Pablo. Complete Pablo. But is there evidence that the recent state of mass shootings is a problem with the CCW process in California? We're analyzing those particular instances, but none of us, not one of us, I'm up here today on this topic asserting that this was in response to. This was a bill that was part of our legislative package last year. We've made some modest tweaks that we think are consistent uh, with the, we think, a very bad ruling, the United States Supreme Court last year. Uh, and we are moving forward this year uh, with conviction. Uh, and I'm moving forward with certainty uh, that it will land on my desk because of the resolve uh, and the character and quality of leadership and will you be today. those calls to lawmakers that might be on the fence, that might have questions, oh, that I, uh, might be involved in the uh, That's, uh, we'll get this on my desk, and I'm looking okay. forward to getting it very shortly. Let, let me, hold on one second, let me answer, yeah. evidence of the governor's presence today, uh, it, it shows this is a priority to, to this governor and to this state. And let me just sort of juxtapose that with some other governors. We have a governor in Florida who is going after uh, Black History Month as a priority. We have a governor in Tennessee who's going after pronouns as a priority. Um, this governor is going after sensible gun safety for the people of California. That in and of itself is laudable and makes a difference. And the fact that we're here talking about a legislative amendment with the Attorney General and the Governor and a slew of legislative leaders shows that this is important. And as far as the effectiveness, it's all of these gun legislations that work in concert with each other, in, that complement each other. We know the statistics work. There are way too many guns in too many hands, and that is a prescription for disaster. Can you know on Tuesday if your law prevented something on Tuesday or Thursday or on Friday? You don't know what specific day, but you know in the aggregate it makes California safer. And to have a governor who recognizes that behind the, di the data and the science and says, you know what, Everything we know points to the needle going in this progressive direction, makes a difference, and I'm going to go out there and lead. We should be proud of that, and we know it makes a difference. Governor, Governor Newsom, we're going to with Tech Nest Stations. You speak about solving for a pattern, and there is a pattern with domestic violence and mass shootings, yep. depending on what research group you look at, anywhere That's 50 right. to 70 percent. Domestic violence is not considered a violent felony in California, so I'm wondering where you stand on the push, I know, from Republicans to try and change that. Well, as it relates to the issue of guns and the relationship uh, to these shootings, I'm very proud of California's leadership on the restraining orders. I'm very proud of California's leadership on relinquishment, the voters of the state of California, and an initiative, Prop 63, advanced relinquishment at adjudication uh, to address the backlog, particularly um, uh, for uh, people not just in domestic violence incidents, but across the spectrum. We expanded it beyond that scope. Uh, the violent restraining order was supplemented last year with money 
uh, to promote the program, I think it was 11 plus million, my recollection, uh, to encourage its utilization, and we've seen that. We've seen a dramatic increase in the number of people. Uh, you're referring, I believe, to an initiative that was approved by the voters, Proposition 57, uh, and uh, provisions that in the past have been loosely defined. I'd have to get more specifics about what any new proposals there are before I comment specifically on that. So that was the, that was the last question. I just want to say that a number of our, my colleagues out here have other gun legislation that they're going to be introducing this year. Stay tuned. This is a team effort that's going to work uh, together to make California safer. And thank you all for being out today. And uh, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Attorney General, and thank you to the activists. You know, we owe it to the activists and the survivors to do everything we can. So thank you all for being out today. Thank you, Mary. We should have Thank you.